Joey. There you go. Good job, Nix. All right, Joey, should we go over to the creek? We're going right over here, Nix. You want my arm, Nix? Well, I think because he wasn't my first child, I sort of knew right away. I just was worried. It was one of those situations you never forget. Basically, he was diagnosed as profoundly brain damaged. He'd had an interuterine stroke and it had taken out the right side of his brain. What do we do? The only thing that we did know at that point in time was that we were going to take care of this young man. Everybody just loves him. He's very brave, he's very determined, and he's also just a bundle of joy. Hmm. Gotta do what I gotta do. He's bright, witty, compassionate. But beyond that, he's empathetic. He connects with people. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Thank you, my brother. It's good to see you, man. Take it easy, huh? Because Nix is handsome and quite able and likable. When you first see him, you don't know. And it is that gap, that, that instant between when he's, when he's seen as normal and when he's seen as not normal. That's where the danger can come in. There's a really wide range of disabilities. Some are visually apparent. So if we see somebody in the grocery store in the community, we can tell right away they're disabled because they're in a wheelchair or they have a seeing eye dog or a cane. But lots and lots of disabilities are not readily apparent. Children who have many types of intellectual disability, children who have autism, children who have ADHD, that can actually be very disabling. And those children look very typical. People with mental illness, any of those can really impair functioning and you know, be a serious disability, but yet not be apparent in any way when you first clap eyes on the person. In society, for the invisible disabilities, until the disability manifests itself, uh, people have the expectation that you're just another individual walking down the street. Nix was involved in a frightening situation not very long ago that could have resulted in a real tragedy simply because an officer didn't recognize his disability. The notion of protecting everybody equally, that has been a challenge for law enforcement throughout our history. And for whatever reason it may be, usually it's difference of some type. People have not received that equal care and concern and treatment from the law enforcement. I know of situations like this where it has led to real danger, real tragedy, and sometimes even death. We had a circumstance, an incident, where one of my officers encountered individuals with disabilities. And because of the behavior, the perceived behavior, it was mistaken for criminal behavior. Right? Because it was different, it was unusual. And the notion that's unacceptable to me as an administrator, as a leader of this organization, is that we would ever alienate anybody because of our ignorance. Some disabilities, like autism or intellectual disabilities, come with some unusual behaviors that are just part of the disorder. Things like hand flapping or pacing while talking to oneself in a loud voice or things of that nature. And those can seem odd when a security guard comes over and perceives his behavior as threatening and slaps handcuffs on and takes him away. I mean, these are big fears for families. And in fact, we know that those kinds of things can happen with young adults and adults with disabilities who are of this invisible type. This is something that is at the forefront of our profession that we need to do a better job, right? We need to address this because 
You cannot have that happen. Nothing undermines the confidence that the public has in policing than that. And if we don't have the trust of the public, well, then we're not effective when we do our job. If professionals don't understand or if they misjudge, that's when real harm can come to these kids. And I really think they're at their most dangerous where they're in a situation that might be fraught anyway, like in a park or at a fair where the police are on patrol because they're looking for danger. They're making assumptions already. And then if the arm goes up or whatever, there's real trouble, almost invariably. If you're walking in the store and you see somebody acting out, you might just think that's a bratty kid, but it may not be at all. It may be just a kid with autism. This job has actually taught me a lot of not passing judgment because knowing what I know now, anybody who can look normal can have a disability. If their behavior is different, their brain is different, okay? All of our behavior is driven by our brain. So if you have a child who has a lot different behaviors, something is actually structurally and functionally different about their brain. When you have a child with disabilities, from the get-go, from when they're very small children, you're facing judgments from the community, from family members, neighbors. People basically are afraid of anything that's different. There's a stigma there. They're better not seen. People think that they are something that's too sad to think about. Nix is out in public a lot. You know, he deals with librarians and booksellers and grocery clerks and all of those people all the time. And the more they all know about the range of disabilities and how different they can be, the better it is for everybody. Ready to roll for us. Ready to roll. Absolutely ready to roll. Right there. I'm not gonna rap, guys. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, man. Huh? Say See you, bird. <laughs> the more education, the more understanding that our officers have, well, the better we are when we go out and interact with the public. There's a real need for training so they can differentiate between a bad guy that's going to grab their gun and shoot them from somebody having an epileptic seizure or someone on the autism spectrum is having a meltdown because they're in sensory overload. Nix and his autistic cousin Joey were on a picnic and they just ran in to use the bathroom. And they went outside and this police officer accused them of inappropriate sexual behavior. He yelled at them. He actually threatened to arrest them. They were very upset and thank God it wasn't worse. Nick's situation could have been traumatic for him, traumatic for the policeman, traumatic for everyone watching. I try and train officers. You be prepared for every single situation that you may encounter. So the expectation of my police officers that they evaluate and very quickly de-escalate a situation. But unfortunately, across the country, you see a significant number of use of force incidents that involve people who are, whether it's disabilities, mental illness, their behavior is outside the norm. And the response is a use of force by a police officer that may or could have or should have been prevented, right, with tools in hand. They really need to learn the hallmarks of people with disabilities. For instance, Nick, sometimes when he's really in trouble, his, his hand will curl. You, you see that curl and you say, okay, that's somebody with brain damage. You know, it's as simple as that. That person has brain damage. Or you see somebody doing this and you say, oh, that's somebody who's autistic and is really not very comfortable right now. I better back off. With so many disabilities out there, Training and education are so important for the safety of these individuals. One of the problems when you just superficially look at someone with autism, even a nonverbal person, they look totally normal. Um, first of all, he may not be able to speak. One of the important things is to be calm. You see, because the fear system is on hyperdrive and, if, and not to be grabbing at it because they tend to react. And, and that's uh, generally one of our first tendencies. That's right. To go to calm is to is to offer that touch. Well, you see, if you just do a little light touch like that, light touch like that is an alerting function. Uh, you know, firm touch tends to be calming, but if you just grab it, it's, it's likely to react just like the way an animal would react to a predator, because the in both people and animals, a real primitive fear uh, mechanism. You know, like to fight the predator off. 
And what's happening is that gets activated. It's also important that, you know, young kids with autism and other handicaps are taught how to interact with, you know, police officers and firefighters so they don't re-interact with just a fear kind of uh, reaction. We need to teach them what's proper behavior in different situations. One of the things you gotta do is you gotta stretch people. Because if you don't stretch them, they don't develop. And I'm seeing too many children with autism, fully verbal, they'll be taught them how to do laundry at a laundromat. Nick and his autistic cousin Joey really wanted to live together independently. And we knew they could do it if, as long as they had a caregiver. We also knew that they know how to behave in public and they'd be fine. But the biggest fear was for their safety. We really, as parents, need to know they'll be safe. Many young adults with things like intellectual disabilities or autism, they see all of their peers in high school graduating, going to college or getting jobs, and moving out of the house, and they want to do that too. So that many times they'll say to their families, actually, I don't want to live in your basement. I want to live in my own apartment. And so one of the great things that's available in many communities are services where adults with disabilities can live together in apartments and have maybe somebody live with them if they need that level of support or have somebody come in daily to check on things or weekly to see if they're paying their bills or if there's enough food in the refrigerator. So there can be a whole range of support services that for individuals who want to and for families who feel comfortable with that, they can actually live independently. We always wanted her to be as independent as possible. and. Now she is very recognizable as being special needs. When she was young, there was no, there was no difference, really. We tried to stay in the background to see how, how people would perceive her. Switch. Right that. The key of the house. If you like me being, being, being an independent woman, you can have everything that you want. This is my kitchen. This is what I do. Dinner. Fabulous dinner. It's like, for example, it's like having someone come up to you and say, hey, how would you like to be with us in the apartment? And you just say, no, thank you. I like to be independent on my own. Thank you very much. Stacy likes living by herself. She's proud of doing that. Nick has to have a caregiver with him, not just because of the seizures, but because emotionally he ranges between 4 and 12. Can you put that on the locker? But he's so responsible and caring and a good person. All parents want for their children specific things. We want them to have the highest quality of life they can have. We want them to be happy. We want them to have meaningful contributions to the community, things that they can feel proud of. It doesn't matter if your child has a disability or not. All parents are searching for ways to have their child achieve the highest level of life satisfaction possible at whatever ability level their child's at. All people have dreams and desires and it's important that everybody have the opportunity uh, to be able to, to pursue those. And I think without us, we would be looking at institutions, we would be looking at sitting at home, we'd be looking at terrible waste of lives. Oh, man. We have a very 
good routine because both boys need routine. Every night they do something different. They have a very full life. One night they go out to dinner. The other nights they eat their dinner at home. They help clear up and do the dishes. They go to the library where Nick likes to get CDs because he loves music and Joey loves books. They do Special Olympics together. They also go bowling. And one night, they stay home and do the laundry. They have to do their laundry. All people need to do useful work. I mean, people want to contribute. Integrating people with disabilities into the community, having them go to the movies, go out to eat, working jobs, all it does is enhance everybody's experience. It's a win-win for everybody. To be able to get up every day, get ready, get dressed, go out, go to a job, work hard, feel good about your job, receive a paycheck is a real part of being a member of society and, and, and feeling like they're part of the same system that you and I are part of. We need to be figuring out how everybody in the community can contribute. Work is pretty easy, it's pretty cool. I'm hungry. There are all kinds of potential dangers that their differences can cause. And the more people learn about who they really are and what they're really like and how much they give to people personally and give to the community at large, the less they're likely to misperceive. We've had a lady that, that has worked at a 7-Eleven at a for 20 years. Customers would come in and want to have a conversation with her. They could get coffee elsewhere, but they had a relationship with this individual and it, it enriched their lives. They are just people. You have got people with severe disabilities that are funny, that are compassionate, that are caring. These children really do have so many strengths and they bring so much to families that maybe isn't readily apparent. But families have told me time and again how they come to really feel like the child's a gift. It's made them have depths of feeling that they didn't even know existed within them. Things like patience and perseverance and advocacy that they never knew they were capable of. In law enforcement, you very quickly learn diversity, and oftentimes, unfortunately, that diversity is what divides communities, but that diversity is what makes us interesting. When we integrate adults with disabilities into the community, we're looking to create the highest quality of life for them that we can. And what that requires is looking at them as individuals and understanding their strengths, their abilities, their interests, and what makes them happy. I think one of the major problems is the inability to conceive what people with these invisible disabilities have to contribute to society. They aren't a threat. They are an incredible benefit. They are examples of what can be done if people are willing to work, cooperate, and recognize their humanity. Make sure that your daughter does her homework so she should and so she can go to college. Y yeah. If not, uh, you should ground her. If not, I should what? Ground her. <laughs> what That's college right, should go to? What college do you think she should go to? University of Utah. University of Utah? Yeah. But what about Brown? Or Polkate? Or Harper? No, just University of Utah. Joy, I love you on my heart. Um, you're a very great kid. <laughs>